Palm event with the big don't argue. Punters will love that. Download our app today and enjoy tackle busting benefits with great odds, more markets, and same game multi every NRL match at Palmer Bed. Gamble responsibly. For gambler's help, call 1 800 858 858. Hello and welcome to episode 385 of Fergie on the Freak. I'm that bloke from Rugby League Project, Andrew Ferguson. You can find me on Twitter at AndrewRP. And joining me as always is the glorious League Freak. You can also find me on Twitter at League Freak. How are you going there, mate? I'm very good, Andrew. How have you been? And tell me, what was our nation's capital like? Um, glorious. Really? You're going to lie straight off? Straight up. Straight off the bat. Wow. <laughs> it was fantastic. Do you know um, do you know that Lake Burley Griffin is a man made lake? I do know that, yeah. Yeah. They know, just, it was basically a valley that they uh they pissed I think in. They, hey? that they pissed in. Just about, you know. It's a valley that they uh made a lake, which is kinda weird. Mm. Well then they wanted to have, you know, coastal views, I guess, for people in Canberra. Mm. Don't fish in it though, because part of the uh part of it used to be a dump. Before yeah, they, you know, get some old coke cans and shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you go through the the Australian Museum, I don't know the actual t- name of it. Mm-hmm. It's just one of the many museums they've got there, which is a good thing. Um, but it looks like when you look out through one of the windows, you're going through looking on the wall and these little glass cases. It looks like you're looking at little presentations of little parts of the of the nation's history. Yeah. And then there's just this one empty window with just a window overlooking Lake Billy Griffin. You go, oh, look, they managed to bring the lake into the museum. That's pretty fantastic. That's like, not nice. Yeah. yeah. But no, it's, uh, it's not bad. I do I do like the museums and stuff there. I'm a history buff. Of course I fucking do. Yeah. Look, the Australian War Memorial is the best place I've ever been. Absolutely. And I got to witness a returned soldier getting to write his name on the wall. They've got a wall there for returned soldiers to write their name on there, which is oh, really? bloody amazing. And he was absolutely chuffed with that. Did you see uh, Ben Robert Smith's uh, uniform from when he won the VC? No. I did okay. see the the picture they've got of him on the wall. It looks like he's trying to take a selfie, but without anything in his hands. It's a very weird pose. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, They they used to have his uniform that he wore when he won the VC, mm-hmm. and it was completely washed, which I didn't like. I thought it should have been just straight as is, you know, mm-hmm. you know with everything on it. But... Uh, yeah, I found that interesting because he's, he's people that don't know he's fucking gigantic. He's he is a big absolutely human, absolutely massive. Yep. Um, the yeah, I loved everything. One of the things that's really shocking is the size. They've got a Huey in there, um, mm-hmm. which is an old helicopter that you may, mainly see out of uh, you see in Vietnam uh, movies and stuff like that. It's the one they had before the Black Hawk. Yes, and you don't realize how small they are until you're standing next yeah, to it, and it's like tiny. a mini. It is tiny. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm. Um, the one thing I did finally get to see, and it has literally taken about five visits ever since I found out about it. Yeah. Um, I got to finally see the Mudlarks jumper. For those who don't know, the Mudlarks was a um, hastily organised rugby league team that played. You know, it was entirely soldiers. There was no prominent rugby league players in them. It's just soldiers who wanted to play rugby league, not rugby union. Um, this is during war, and especially World War I, um, rugby union was the only game allowed to be played, if you wanted to play rugby, that is, in the military services, all of them. And so there were a few rebel players that just wanted to play rugby league. And so they made their own jumpers. They were blue. They made their own emblem of a mudlark, which is a bird, and they sewed them all together, and they put them all on, and they used to play games every now and then, mostly against the British. Mm-hmm. Um, and this jumper was found... Um, and presented to the War Museum many years ago, and it still has the mud on it from the battlefield. Wow, that's very cool. And it is ridiculously small. Yeah, which, people people back then weren't big. No, but it, it gets me how small it was. Yeah. Um. Yeah, it's um, it's something I've been wanting to see for a long time. I finally got to see it, and it's just out of the corner of my eye, I went, oh, there it is, mm. and it's. It's weird because as I was going through the whole war museum, I was talking about certain things that happened um, and how I know of them and how they were linked to, you know, some of the stuff I've learned in rugby league. I'm sitting there going, am I trying to turn this into a rugby league museum? I mean, it's a long stretch, but I'm having a fair crack at it. 
and they've got the um the wall of honor outside in yeah. the memorial section and i'm going up there and i'm I was pointing out all the soldiers' names who were rugby league players, prominent like test players and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got my, you know, they they give you little fake poppies to put in the the memorial there. Mm-hmm. So my daughter grabbed a heap of them and I just said, "Oh, come, we'll go put some in there next to some footy players." And so we went around and did that. It was pretty cool. That is cool. Like I know when I went, I must have been about I don't know five to eight years ago now, and I think I spent about six hours there. Oh, it's easy to do. Very easy. And, like, I'm very much a, a history buff, and so I was going around. One of the things I wanted to make sure I saw was the um, the stick from the Red Baron's uh, plane. Because, yes. But, so I made sure I saw that, and it's weird. It's kind of off in a corner. Well, it was off in a corner when I went anyway. Um, and for those people that don't know, it, it's – Considered to be fact that Australian soldiers on the ground shot down the Red Baron. And now, there's a bunch of other people that feel like they shot him down too, but it's, you know, from people that were in the air at the time and all sorts of stuff, but it's generally considered that the Australians shot him down. And they they pretty much consider that to be his uh, control stick from the plane because obviously when the Red Baron went down, everyone stripped his plane apart. They all wanted part of his plane. Yeah, like celebrity um, status in the war. Yeah, yeah. So um, I, that was really interesting. But, like, I was just – the things that got me were when you would see someone's canteen that you know was on their hip and it had a small bullet, bullet hole in one side and the other side is just blown to shreds. And just the little things like that, it, like spoons that would be, you know, wrapped around a, a – piece of wire because it had been near an explosion and the things that belonged to people that were very personal that uh you know they had on them and these things are ripped apart and you know that if they're ripped apart the person that had them was ripped apart as well and uh it's the it's the best place i've ever been it's the most special place i've ever been i could go there tomorrow and spend another six hours um, just an amazing, amazing place for so much history. Yeah, the one thing that I really, really um, love the most, and it kind of hits you a little bit too, they've got a huge um, boat there that landed on the shore of Gallipoli, and it was it was used to get people who had been shot or injured and away from there. Mm. Um, and uh, Stan Carpenter was a rugby league player for Newcastle. He was a, a medic. And got nominated for a VC a few times um, because he would run out. He ran out onto the shore at the Gallipoli landing, and he was rescuing men who were dying, um, or men who couldn't even get off the boats. So they were being, you know, they were under fire. He would get them and reel them back and put them into one of these boats, and it would have been one exactly like that. And you can still see the bullet holes all over it. Mm. Um, that's that's a very very uh, sombering moment sitting there looking at that, knowing that you know there's a fair chance people were shot and killed in that thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's incredible. And like, like I don't think people realize that at Gallipoli where they landed is like an amphitheater. It is basically, if somebody said, create the worst environment to do a uh, beach landing on, it would basically create Gallipoli. It's not a big place. You've got good coverage with uh, machine gunning coverage. Um, and that's where they landed by accident because that's where they were surrounded. Around the beach. That's yeah. The terrible. It was terrible. Oh, horrible, horrible thing. But, uh, yeah, absolutely fascinating place. That mm-hmm. and the Tower of London are the only two um, war museum type things I've been to with such historically amazing artifacts in them. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, war museum. Absolutely love it. Always have- go there. Every time I go to Canberra, always go to the war museum. I haven't been to the Tower of London, but I definitely would love to go. Like, it's really the only place in London I'd want to see. Um, I don't care about the palaces and stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, it's at the Tower of London would be awesome. Um, I don't think – like, I've obviously been to all the museums and stuff in, in Sydney. Um, I guess the other one's the Rugby League Museum that used to <laughs> be in uh, Huddersfield. Did you, did you ever go to the Rugby League Museum in Sydney? No. No, I didn't. Ah, because I if it's still there. I don't know if it's open or not, but like 
I was going to go for a while, but it's a, it, you know, it's in Moor Park basically. It's hard to get to. Is, um, is the NRL headquarters still there next to the SCG slash whatever the SFS is right yeah, now, holding the ground? I believe it is. Yeah, because the museum is on the, it's on the foyer. So as you walk in, it's to your left as you walk through the door. All right. Cause yeah, but you don't have to go anywhere. And you don't have to pay to go in either. Because uh, I, it's just a pain in the ass to get to for me, and like. You know, just you know what it's like. You're traveling in Sydney. It's money over money over money, and don't take your car because otherwise you're going to spend fifty bucks an hour on parking. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's very rugby league to put the museum in the worst place it could be, and yes. then probably close it. I mean, I keep on hearing that it's been closed for a long time now, but I could be wrong. Well, I'm, I was, uh, I was, you know, I'm good mates with the bloke who used to be the curator there, and I believe he was never replaced when they, um, yeah, when they essentially moved him on. Yeah. So what um, they should have done is called you up, right? And I know you'll never say say this yourself, but if someone's listening from the NRL, call up Andrew. You can have a full time historian slash curator of the museum, and just get him on, and he will have that job until he dies. OK, he's not going to be looking for another job. That's the dream job, my guess. Well, is, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And I'll do it for like a paltry 250 grand a year. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's that's what you need to, to you know, live in Sydney, obviously. <laughs> so you want a small place then? Yeah, I'll look, I'm just looking for a, you know, a place to park a, a one man tent. Someone's I don't know what the rest of the family's going to do, but, you know. Quarter of a million bucks a year, someone's renting. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You've rented a toilet. <laughs> a small toilet. Doesn't it, have the it only has the half flush button. It doesn't have a full flush button. That's yeah. an extra fifty grand. Gotta to, got to save the environment. We don't that, wanna <laughs> we don't want to waste water in Sydney, Andrew. <laughs> no, we can't have that. So uh, you know what's been going on is uh they've been playing rugby league over the last couple of days, hey? Yes, yes, I, I have heard that. Now, should we talk about the round two games? Because I've watched all of the round two games so far, and I've got some thoughts. I've watched bits and pieces of some of them, mm-hmm. so we can have a bit of a yak about the round two games to okay. date. Well, first of all, I mean, the Storm game on Thursday night, uh, it ended up being a close game. It ended up going into Golden Point because of a two-point field goal by Latrell Mitchell, which was fantastic kick, but two-point field goals are fucking ridiculous and should be scrapped. Correct. Because the reason I don't know why you get extra points because you kicked it from further out. It makes no sense at all. Um, but it's very pers- AFL like almost. Yeah, yeah, and any basketball. Time you, yeah, it's like fucking ridiculous. So a couple of things: the Storm, they had a couple of players come back, but they also had lost a few players. I know it's dangerous, but have they taken a step back? I, I don't know yet. But, it's the thing, like in the, in the past, when you watch the uh, the Storm play, mm-hmm. when they got off to a good start, they did not take their foot off the throat. Yeah, and that's kind of happened the last two weeks. From what I was, you know, I've only seen a bit of highlights and stuff. But yeah, I watched more of that game on in round two against South, mm-hmm. and they started very strong, mm-hmm. but they looked like they were struggling to go through the motions in the second half. It was really weird watching them play. They had, they had the bunny stretched, you know, early yeah. on that game and then just let them, let them back in. It was just the weirdest, weirdest thing. You just don't see that from a storm side. No, and, and the Rabbitohs weren't playing great, you know, no. and, and they stormed home. Um, obviously, the storm pretty much shut it down in the in the golden point period. And I believe it was, uh, it was a Pappenhausen that kicked a field goal. Yeah, it was an interesting field goal too because he – he stepped the, the defence running at him and then running full tilt forwards and then kicked the field goal anyway. Like, usually mm. you see field goals kicked by blokes who are stationary. Yeah, He's I sprinting was... forwards and then going, oh, you know what, I won't go for the line break. I'll just slot the field goal over here and just nails it. It was pretty impressive. Yeah, it was. It was good. And but, uh, uh, the game not... was the game was largely dross. Yeah, it was a little bit, yeah, from what I saw of it. Um, and the Rabbitohs, I mean, they're 0-2 to start the season. They... A desperate for a halfback. Really, really desperate. Yeah. Cody Walker's struggling. Yeah. Because um, he needs that direction and he's not, he's not getting it. And that was always going to be the issue. 
it actually made me think of like after their first game where it was the same thing, they were desperate for a halfback. And so every game I watched after that Broncos loss, I just kept on thinking, would they take this guy? Would they take this guy? And the answer kept on being yes, yes, yes. Even if there were some pretty average halfbacks out there, I think that the Rabbitohs would take an average halfback right now. It makes you wonder why they didn't chase Moses and buy. Well, I said average. <laughs> well, that's the thing. You don't need much. You just need someone to take, you know, some of the duties off uh, Cody Walker. That's it. <clears throat> then again, and did you, did I, you see did you see him playing against the Panthers? I did see some of it. I will tell you what, I was I was really enjoyed it because he wasn't wearing a Tigers jumper. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those games. For <laughs> it was just one of those classic like. Damn, he must be a really nice bloke because I don't know what he's doing in first grade. <laughs> he's, so he's, the, a, he's a good fella, top bloke. Yeah. So the Dragons made the Panthers work for it in this game. The Panthers won 20 points to 16. They got out to a quick lead and it looked like they were absolutely going to just strangle the Dragons and put 40 on them. And then they switched off. They stopped playing and the Dragons slowly started working their way back into the game. It was a good 40-20 kick there by Ben Hunt that really got them on the front foot. But the second half, every fucking decision went against the Dragons, like every single one. And they had a couple of sin binnings where there was a, a kick where Sean O'Sullivan – it wasn't a kick. Sean O'Sullivan runs to the line and then at the last second passed the ball. Well, obviously there was somebody coming to tackle him. The guy comes, tackles him. And d- didn't fully tackle him, just, you know, his momentum took him into to O'Sullivan. And he got 10 in the bin for that. It was absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. And then there was a, another sit and binning late um, where there was a collision uh, after a kick and the Panthers kickers were going through. And uh, there was a sit binning from that as well. Just ridiculous. And, you know, it makes me wonder, like, why are we still jumping at shadows when it comes to officiating the game, because there's been a number of games already this season that I've watched where it's back to that thing of like the referees are terrified to let the game go on. And I don't blame the referees. The referees are being directed to control a games like this by their, their superiors who, you know, give jobs and continue to give the best games to the people that are reactionary to anytime somebody stays down, anytime they see something that's a bit rough for, you know, there was that. Sometimes you just got to let these teams play football, and it's pissed me off they're not letting them just play football. Yeah, it's um. Well, I'll ask. Did you see the tackle that Mahe Fanua did over in the Super League yesterday that got him sin binned? I was sent that video. I've retweeted it on my Twitter feed. Oh my I, god! I can't believe. I cannot believe that that was even. It looked at as a penalty. Yeah. I and, mean, even even the commentators were talking about how he must have just got a hand on it and he knocked it on, and that's what they thought was the reason why the game was being pulled up. Mm. And when you see the hit, it's it's not even a hit. Like he's it's full chest into a body, and he's coming to a stop as he hits him. Yeah, yeah. And look, that's the thing. It's you can't. I and I put up a. a, a fucking one of the gifs you know the gifs on twitter Mm. and i said if you run at the line with the rugby league ball at a rugby league defensive line and at the last minute you flick the pass away i want you to hit me as hard as you can because that's your fucking job you know and if you get so if you run at the line with the ball with your back half turned and then you pass it at the very last second and you get smashed stop fucking whinging get up and play on and if you're hurt well don't run at the fucking line with your back turns wet because, you know, it, I don't believe in, oh, we've got to protect these players from that. No, we don't have to protect players from that. If you're taking the ball in that situation, guess what? You're going to get smashed. Don't do it. That's right. And, uh, people might think it's a bit weird because, you know, we've done an awful lot of talk about CT and stuff like that. You can have both arguments. Like, you can pl- you play rugby league fully aware of the risks that you have there. Mm-hmm. The thing is, once once you do get a head knock, the protocol has to be clear. It has to be entirely about protecting the player, not the club's results for that season. Yeah. That's that's where the argument lies. But for some reason, 
we're finding too many people within rugby league ranks, not just in the NRL, but in the Super League as well, the RFL, where they think that we now have to try and protect the players at all costs, at all times, to the point where they're trying to take the physicality out of a physical game. And it's, you can't. It's yeah, stupid. it won't happen. Yeah, like it, You either have touch football or you have rugby league. There's no middle ground. Exactly. And there's a reason why a player, most players don't get the ball and run straight at the chest of an opposition forward because you will get smashed 100% of the time. Yeah, you're not getting through that. No, no. So, and, and it is just as dumb to do that as it is to run at the line and think you can run across the face of the defense and stuff and not get absolutely poleaxed when someone finally gets to you. Um, you've got to expect to get tackled if you've got the ball. Yeah, and I mean, the you, defense is not going to wait for you to turn around and face them. Yeah. They're not going to go, hang on, has he got the ball? He's got, yeah, he's got the ball. Now I'll tackle him. Because if you do that, it's already too late. Yeah. It's, it's silly. And, you know, I, I just thought those those sin binnings were stupid. I thought that penalty was stupid. And the one in the Super League game was, I mean, that was absolutely fucking outrageous. It was, it was. And as people know, we're not ref bashers. No. But, and this is this is not even fully to do with ref bashing. These are, just, as you said, these are decisions that have been made by the people who run the game. Mm-hmm. And the officials just have to cop it. And that's what they do. They officiate according to what their bosses tell them to do. And the refs are the one who cop the hell for that, not the officials who tell them what to do and what the rules have been changed to do. The refs are stuck in a shit sandwich they can't get out of. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and more often than not, they're not the ones at fault. No. And they're, they're in that environment where they sit down, they review their, you know, every single game with the referees. You know, and the people above them are saying, well, why didn't you call this? Why didn't you call that? We got a call from the opposition coach. He wasn't happy that his halfback was put on his ass 15 times in a match. The referee can't say, well, the fucking halfback ran 15 times into the guts of the fucking defensive line and then passed it at the last second. It's silly. It's absolutely silly. And, you know, that's why the that's why you need the good administration. You need an administration where if a, a, a coach gets up and he says, oh, you know, they, they're giving us bad calls and the halfback should be fine and stuff, that the administration doesn't react if the coach has been a complete and utter fucking idiot. Fully agree. Makes me wonder if maybe we should have a former coach running the NRL. I'm trying to think if we've ever had that before. I mean, was, was uh, Arco a former coach? Uh, great, great player. I don't know that he was a coach, though, was he? I have to look that up. I have a feeling he might have been. Really? I, I mean, he did. No, he did, he did coach Manly. Okay, there you go. For five years. Okay. Yeah. That's an interesting one. It, yeah, it's... Uh... It just seems like we're reactionary. I, I And I don't like watching games of football where you just get to a point in the game, you're like, can you just let them play football? Yeah. You know, some of the things that we've, we've got officials at the moment who run the game, who have no feel for the game. Yeah. And I'm sorry, PVL, but playing the game as a six year old or an eight year old, whatever the fuck it was when you played the game, it's not the same. I know you might think it might be, but it's not. <laughs> the other thing is too, like they're not all going to be masterpieces. They're not all going to look like no. what, you know, a, an NRL TV advert from 20 years ago would have been. I would have said this year's advert, but this year's advert was polish shit. <laughs> um, so, you know, they're not going to be all free, free-flowing games. Sometimes a game is scrappy. Sometimes the two teams knuckle down and they just, you know, it's an arm wrestle. That's fine. Sometimes two teams beat the shit out of each other. That's, that's fine. As that's, long as That sort of variance is what makes rugby league great, though. Exactly, exactly. You know, no one wants to watch touch football all the time. No. Um, if we did, if we wanted to watch that, touch football would be the fucking biggest sport in Australia. Exactly. We'd be watching touch football. Yeah. Simple as that. So it's it's very frustrating to actually be in a situation now where the rules are as far removed from common sense as they've ever been. Mm-hmm. And... It, Anyway, going back to the Panthers game, Panthers-Dragons. Panthers, Panthers uh, 
look disinterested in the second half. Dragons have been a lot better than I thought they'd start the season. Um, and the other thing I took out of it, especially after the next game, is have I overestimated where the Panthers are right now? Because in the next game, the Seagulls were blasted off the park pretty early by the Sydney Roosters. The Roosters ran out 26 points to 12 winners over the Seagulls. In the second half, the Seagulls kind of, you know, made a bit of a contest of it, but not much. The game was always pretty comfortably um, in hand for the Roosters. But the Seagulls at times looked really bad, especially defensively. And it made me think, did they flatter the Panthers in that first round when the Panthers just shut them down? Uh, maybe they did, you know, because the, the Dragons threw a lot more of the Panthers than the Seagulls did, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's interesting because I thought the biggest issue Penrith were going to have was Cleary's loss. Mm-hmm. But... And and look, it is. But I think O'Sullivan's done a much better job than people probably give him credit for. Yeah. He's defensively has been pretty solid, which is the big area that they were going to miss with Cleary not being there. Mm. Um, but he's been pretty good in that area. His playmaking is not, obviously it's not Cleary skill, but it hasn't been bad. They're still yeah. scoring points and winning games, so it must be good enough. But... Uh, yeah, the, the Panthers are sort of looking a bit uh, like a daisical in the second half of their their two games. Mm-hmm. The Manly side, I think there's times when you, you're watching them play and they're thinking, oh, we can't just give it to Tom Trebovich all the time because people would be expecting it. Yeah. But fuck, people were expecting it all the time last year and he tore teams to shreds anyway because he's just that fucking good. Just give the bastard the ball. But don't give him, don't give him shitty half opportunities where you pass that a crap ball to him because you're trying to create some sort of space for him that you're unable to do. Give him some space. That's all he needs. He doesn't need you to do the hard work for him. He just needs early ball. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It, it kind of feels like what Manly's trying to do with Tom Trevojevic is the same thing that Peyton was trying to do to Tom Malolo last year. Oh, we don't want to go to him all the time or and have him as the key person all the time. There's other people here. We need to use them as well. And go, yeah, you know what? If you've got something that's as good an attack as, as that weapon, just fucking use it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You can develop yeah. your team around that, but you get one bloke in good firm early. He's, <laughs> he's a genuine superstar. Just keep going there until everyone else picks up. Yeah, exactly. And look, they did that last year and look how it turned out, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you see, I think it was uh, last week, after they had lost to the Panthers in the first round, Paul Kent said that it's time to consider moving Tom Trebojevic to a different position. (laughs) (laughs) And I thought, thought, these fucking idiots. And I I said to you before the podcast, like that's why we're getting some really fucking weird articles being put out because – there's no real drama going on outside of what's going on on the field. So these fucking journalists, and as I said during the week, I use journalists as a slur. They have to write about rugby league, and it is so plainly obvious. They don't know what the fuck they're talking about when they write about actual rugby league. It's it's insane. I remember seeing, seeing the news thing about um, Kent suggesting that Tom should be in the house, and I thought... The one thing that makes him stand out and that makes him really good is his ability to come into the back line late. He's a ball runner. Mm. All of our top quality fullbacks in the game at the moment, they're good ball runners. Mm-hmm. They've also got the skills to, you know, have the ball playing skills as well. Even Slater, mm-hmm. ball runner first. Ponga, um, fuck my, every fucking fullback that's been good, good ball runner. Why mm-hmm. would you take that and put him in the halves? you're taking away the one strength they get, and that is doing kick returns or being on one side of the field where two other halves have done a lot of the hard work setting plays up. Look at the way Tedesco played today. And you see there what you get when you have a fullback playing in his specialised position. There was one lovely play they put on the left-hand side there with Tedesco where you can see he was going to get the ball because he's standing right next to another player. And you knew that player was going to be taking a decoy run in towards the post. Tedesco was going to get the ball out the back. And it's exactly what happened. 
All he had to do was draw and pass. It's exactly what he did, but his timing is so good at it, it created a try or a yeah. try-scoring opportunity. And that's what you need a fullback for. That, just because they can do that the same way a 5 eighth can do it doesn't mean they automatically become a good 5 eighth. Because one thing that Paul Kent doesn't fucking understand yet, I don't know why, is that fullbacks don't tackle very often. And they're not very good when it comes to making tackles because they're not designed to be tackling props. Yeah. Their job is to stop kicks and occasionally they've got to pull down one bloke who's making a run, so they usually tackle them around the legs. Fullbacks might make like three tackles a game. You put them in the middle where they're going to make 20-odd tackles a game, plus do all that attack stuff as well with no space. Why do people think that's going to work? Because it did for Lockyer? Lockyer's a fucking freak. Yeah, like you're talking about, like... I don't even know what the percentage would be because you're talking about maybe one of the top. You could make a, a convincing case one of the top five players ever. You know, you could make a very easy case one of the top ten players ever. Like, yeah, that's the level you're talking about. Yeah, he, you can't compare to him. Mm. People try and compare players to, um, you know, Clive Churchill, Danny Messenger, stuff like that. You going? You can't. You can't compare batsmen to to Donald Bradman. Yeah, exactly. You, the bar is too high. Yeah. They're I once in a they were, lifetime type players, for fuck's sake. I remember when they would compare Slater to Clive Churchill. Yeah. And you would not find a bigger Billy Slater fan than me, right? But you j- just read about what Clive Churchill was doing. Just read about it. And then see what all of his peers were saying about him. And keep in mind, he was doing all of this in an era where he couldn't look at tape where he was playing against a lot of people he didn't know that who they were, especially when you would go on tour. You n- never always knew everyone in the opposition team. And just look at how dominant he was in every single game and every level he played for so long. And Billy Slater, great, great, great player, could do so many things. Imagine adding three more layers of greatness onto Billy Slater. And then you might be starting to talk about where Clive Churchill was. It's insane. It's absolutely insane. It'd be like saying, um, you know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to think of a, like, say Cameron Munster. Uh, Cameron Munster, he's big 5 eighth, a bit like King Wally. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> st- let's, like, stop. Stop right now. Shut your face. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, there's this, always this constant want from the idiots in the media who don't know how to properly describe someone and their style. Mm. Remember when Braith and Astor came along and they were likening him to Brad Fittler? Yeah. And the reason being is because he had ball skills and he was built a bit like a lock like Fittler was. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, that was I it. I have actually watched much of the game. They went, oh, he looks a bit like Fittler's physique and he can pass the ball a bit. Oh, Le- that was, that was the bulk out, of it. But leaving out the part... That Brad Fittler started as a centre. Yes. And and had the ability to be a literal representative centre. And then filled out a little bit and could play lock, but had the skills of a five eight. And, and it's yeah, it's uh you know, it, it's some of the comparisons are very weird and very uh they're not thought through. No. And they they're done purely because they don't know how to describe a player's style. Mm. So just, oh, let's just say that they're the next yada, 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 or they're you know, in the same mould of blah, 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 blah. Hang on. Why can't you tell us what the player's like? like? What's their features? What's their strengths? What do they do? What's good? What makes you think this? They don't know. Yeah. They don't know. I mean, remember when Luke Brooks had his debut? Absolutely tore the Dragons apart. Unbelievably destroyed them. And the first thing that happened was the next Andrew Johnson. Hang on. Mm-hmm. No, I've I've seen Luke Brooks playing in the lower grades. He had a stunning debut, and he is capable of performances like that, and has performed, has produced a fair few of them in his career. He was never ever going to be living up to any hype about matching him with Andrew Johns. No player will. No, that's fucking stupid. It's absolutely silly. Oh. And, and the thing is, too, it's like uh, I, I remember hearing a, a comparison, and it was more about the way they played defence a little bit between Tommy Rodonigas and Andrew Johns, because they were both pretty big halfbacks and v- both very aggressive defensively. Mm-hmm. I wish I could remember who was saying the comparison. I just can't. But they were saying that they they were both 
you know, you lost nothing defensively with both of those players. But of course, Andrew Johns had a lot more attacking skill than Tommy Rodonigas. And that's taken nothing away from the late, great Tommy Rodonigas. It's just the way that halfbacks developed um, after Tommy Rodonigas, basically. Because then I guess the next step from him was like a, you've got the likes of uh, Sterling and Mortimer were yeah. coming after him, who apparently, my, I remember my grandfather uh, telling me, um, when Rodonicus would play against Sterling, he would belt the fuck out of him. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tommy hated anyone who wore the same number as him on the opposition side. Yeah, yeah. And he would go out of his way to fucking destroy him. Yeah, and, and then after those guys, then you start to get into the Langers and, you know, players like that, which is uh, – Stewart is another one where they were a next evolution. And then you get Andrew Johns coming off the back of them, which I don't think we've really seen. I mean, Thurston was very, very, very good. Um, he probably come as close as you could get to a Johns sort of all-encompassing attacking halfback yeah. who could just drag a team to a win. Um, I, I've – you know, I saw somebody saying that Cooper Cronk was one of the great players in the game. And, and look, everyone's entitled to their opinion. But I thought Cronk was more of a a little bit more of a sterling sort of player that he was very good at guiding a team around. But he he didn't have that absolute magic that a Langer had or a, a Johns had or even a Thurston had. But And that's my opinion. You know, it's... I, I think... Don't mind. I personally think Sterling had that magic. I think Kronk is the level below all of them. Well, I, they they compared – there was a, a picture, and I wish I – if you go on Twitter, you'll probably find it. There was They did a picture of um, of Cameron Smith, Billy Slater, and Kronk, and they said, I, the, I believe that all of these players are of the same caliber. And I said, look, I think Kronk was a couple of levels below those sorts of players. Because, I mean, Smith is the best hooker of all time. There's no doubt about that. And Slade is one of the best fullbacks of all time. There's no doubt about that. Mm. But Kronk, and Kronk was a very, very good halfback. But there's a difference between very good and great. Yeah. The one thing Kronk had, which a lot of halfbacks don't get, is ultra consistent. Mm-hmm. Like the difference between a good Kronk game and a bad Kronk game was so fucking minute. Mm-hmm. And that's... And I know it doesn't sound like much, but that is a, a really, really strong commodity to have in a halfback because you know you're going to get a very strong, consistent, reliable performance from your, your main playmaker every mm-hmm. fucking game. Mm-hmm. Whereas Andrew Johns had bad games. You know, you just you don't get a bad Cooper Cronk game. Yeah. But you never yeah. get an Andrew Johns at his absolute peak game out of Cooper Cronk. Yeah, never. Like it, it, the the difference between Kronk's best game and John's best game is not even comparable. It's poles really. apart. Yeah, yeah. Poles apart. Whereas, uh, do you remember that game where Andrew Johns um he dyed his hair and he had yes. an absolute stinker? Yes. And uh, it, that it, for that was forever a warning sign. Like I remember, I I don't know if it was last year or the year before, but Dylan Brown dyed his hair and he did it for charity, right? Yeah. But when I and I didn't know this, so when he runs out and his hair's dyed, I'm like, oh man, this is not good. <laughs> <laughs> this is the warning signs, you know. As I think, yeah, dyeing your hair is not a good thing. I think Matt, Matty Rogers did it as well. Yep. Yeah, there was somebody else did it on that in that 2000 World Cup. There was Matt Rogers and someone else. I feel like did that. What was it? Uh, Adam McDougall or someone? It, yeah, might have been Mad Dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it was. It didn't, it's, it's not a wise move. No, no. A kick out seems to be the only one who's bucking the trend. Although, I mean, he started the game today pretty well, but fuck, he ended it terribly. I just uh, think he's, he's out of match fitness. You reckon? I think he... Look, I think that he looks all right personally, but uh, it's that same thing of... I talked, I've talked about it for a year, you know? I know. Would but, you replace him if you replaced him with someone that was just a solid forward for you know it's going to be half as much next year when the Bulldogs have signed him? Um, would they be a better club for it? I don't know. We'll find out next year. That's true. That's true. I think all you need out there though on that side is just a very very good line runner. Yeah, that would do. That, that would, would do. really do the job. Yeah, you could get away with Liam Fulton out there. 
<laughs> Can you imagine the size of Liam Fulton out in the Panthers' side? That'd be crazy. Uh, that, that's the thing that gets me about him, okay? A lot of people don't really think much about Liam Fulton. You look at his frame, and he played in the back row for the majority of his career. Mm. Um, and he was pretty solid. Mm-hmm. Very, very good runner of the ball. Very good, like, you know, running really strong lines. Um, and a reliable defender. He didn't miss too many tackles. He wasn't one of those blokes that peeled off big tackles. They usually went low. But a solid sort of player. I think um, I see Yeo sort of follows in a very similar trend. I think Yeo's obviously better, but um, similar sort of plan. You, you look at them and you don't think there's much to their game, but when you actually sit down and study and watch them, you're going, Fuck, they run good lines. <laughs> yeah, the thing about Yo, though, is that he's he's pretty tall. Like, he is pretty tall. And, and uh, I'm, always, I'm always surprised by the way he can engage the line, make a defensive line stop, and, and him not stop himself. You know, everyone's waiting for his ball playing to kick in because he is an all right ball player for a lock. Um but yeah, Liam Fulton. It also doesn't help when you're called Fulton, you know. It's like it'd be like be, being called Messenger or Churchill. Like you've got to be a fucking good play before anyone says, "Oh yeah." Well, he's like he didn't come from the family. Yeah, yeah. It's it's just yeah. it's one of those things, though. You know, it's a fucking big name to carry. <laughs> just so you know, mm-hmm. Yo's only eight centimeters taller than Fulton. Is that all? Yeah. How much heavier, though? Wouldn't be much. I'm guessing it's about, no, actually, it's probably fair, probably about 10 kilos, because I think yeah. Fulton never got over 97 kilos. Oh, I'm pretty man. sure Yo's just hitting on 100. Yeah, I would feel like, oh, man, I would bet that that's one of those. The West Tigers are the only team that you can look at the weights of their players and say they're fucking adding eight kilos to him. <laughs> isn't it that's true it's very true like other teams that you they they're you know not as bad but the west tigers they'll be like oh yeah this guy don't worry about him he's fucking 98 kilos and you're like i've stood next to him I'm as big as he is what are you talking about <laughs> but dinner's as big as this bloke oh <laughs> uh, there we go what else went on uh that that's it so far that's it all right we've got some emails yeah, we got some emails. So, um, these so I've held these back. I haven't read out any emails until you got back um, from your sabbatical. Uh, <laughs> I like that sabbatical. Yeah. Uh, so here's one from Lightning McQueenbian. Yep. And the message, and this is the subject is NRL tipping in Super League. The message says, "G'day, cunts. Um, <laughs> fuck round one tipping. Ha ha." Like the rest, like the vast majority of people, I'm reeling from round one results so far. Uh, who the fuck would pick the Knights over the Roosters after 2001? <laughs> Hell, man. That's a grudge to hold. Uh, <laughs> anywho, great to have the footy back proper and the crowds too. I'm travelling up to Sydney for a couple of games this year. Eels versus Tigers in a few weeks should be fun for my son and I. As Eels fans, not so much for my wife and daughter, who are Tigers fans. Poor women. Yeah. Always making bad choices. The main <laughs> reason for my... <laughs> Why is that really funny for some reason? I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> the main reason for my email is regarding Super League. You blokes have done such a great job describing the many good things about the Super League competition in previous podcasts that I reckon I'm going to take the plunge and start watching it more intently. My question is, what team should I follow? I need a team that reads like my old school report card. Shows a lot of potential, but can't apply themselves. He already sounds like a Hull FC fan to me. He does, he does. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Eels tragic, St Kilda and AFL. I don't know what that means. Uh, Tottenham Hotspur and EPL. I don't know what that means. And Rams from when oh, they were in St Louis in the NFL. Maybe Warrington. Yeah. How often are Warrington sitting up there, the you know, one of the top four, five, six teams? They just don't get the job done. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point, actually. You'd be a wire fan. And they've got a, they look good on paper, too. I also feel like he's not violent enough to be a Hull FC fan. Yeah, you've got to be pretty... 
maladjusted is the wrong word. Mm. But uh, yeah, you, you've got to have a bit of fire. If you said to a Hull FC fan, have you burnt out a car before? If they answer yes, they're not a Hull FC fan yet. That's right. a, Hull, a Hull FC fan would look at you and say, one car? <laughs> so define car. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, like, is a hatchback a car or is that just a wheelbarrow? Look, you know, Hull, you're going for the like that. Hull FC fans are the only fans that take home the goalposts occasionally, okay? Actually, you've said that to a Hull FC fan. They say, are we talking daily, weekly, yearly? <laughs> <laughs> I, I burnt out one car this week. <laughs> Um, he says, you can see a, a pattern of mediocrity and disappointment in my supported teams, apart from the Rams, Rams who threw everything at that year's Super Bowl and won it. What a fucking blood of Super Bowl it was, too. Um, which I don't, Super know, League... I don't know what we're talking about here. It sounds like a Tupperware conversation. Do you know, I, when I was in high school, I used to take the first day of school off to watch the Super Bowl every year. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, fuck school. You don't need school kids. Uh which Super League team should I follow? I have an idea and will tweet the answer to you both if you pick who I think you're going to pick for me. Keep up the great work, Lightning McQueenbian. Yeah, I feel like he's a he is a either Y a Y fan or probably not a Huddersfield fan. I think a Y. No, no, no. I think you nailed it. It's either, it's either Warrington or, or uh, Hull FC, but I, yeah. Yeah, I think Warrington. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So, how about that? We've picked Warrington for your Lightning McQueenbian. Yeah. Now, let's look for... <clears throat> we, we don't care what your answer is now. We've we've decided it for you. You have to just yeah. accept it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, okay, here's another one. Here's a, an email from Chris. Uh, I actually emailed Chris back and let him know that we were going to address this when you got back. Uh, so hopefully he's still listening because that was that was like three weeks ago, Andrew. I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> uh, the subject is NRL and gambling. And he says, do you ever see rugby league disassociating with gambling? Personally, I think the overabundance of gambling in the NRL is a blight on the game, even though it brings in heaps of revenue. I find it particularly concerning when you hear young children discussing the odds of upcoming games using gambling terminology in playgrounds. I can see you blokes recently parted, partnered with the tipping firm, and I know you have spoken against gambling in the past. Have we spoken against it? Probably against. I know I've spoken against the uh, yeah, things like commentators. I remember, remember there was that period where Tom Waterhouse was on the doing sideline commentary, and he was not yeah. actually providing any information. Yeah, I mean, not like sideline commentators do half the time back then. Anyway, um, he was just there to get his face on TV and talk about odds for his website. And I remember being strongly opposed to that because that's the product that kids watch. I don't mind if the NRL has betting partnerships with, you know, betting companies, just like they do with every other sort of company. Yeah. But for some reason, there's this um, much stronger need to talk about odds and betting and stuff like that. But there's never any need to talk about, you know, what new phone deal Telstra has out. See, you know I, what I mean, so that we, we yeah. go we go above and beyond to help promote the betting company, but yeah. we don't do that for any other company. And I, I, I find that that an interesting position. I think it has to do with a lot of the people that commentate the game. Like I, I know that uh, I absolutely. I think I've talked about um. Don't. It, it, don't take the betting like the betting tips from the betting company. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like if the betting the person that works for the betting company says, you know what, this, here's a here's my hot tip. Don't don't listen to them because yeah. they've got a vested interest. Let me fi- finish his email, okay? Yeah. So is gambling so ingrained in the game that there's no point fighting the system? As Seth Rollins once said, I didn't sell out, I cashed out. You know Seth Rollins? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um. Yeah, look, I th- I've got no problems with betting. I'm not a big punter myself. Um, I remember years ago, I had a a younger family member who was j- they were about twenty, and they were talking about the gambling they were doing, and I was a bit shocked by it because they were. It took me a bit longer to get into gambling. You know, I was a little bit older and stuff like that. 
And it wasn't that I wasn't around gambling because I was, you know, I remember I would go with my grandfather sometimes when he'd put his, he'd, you'd have to go to the TAB to put your punts on early on and then go back to my grandparents' house and he would listen to 2KY radio and listen to the horses, you know. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't like I wasn't exposed to gambling and obviously, you know, going to Panthers Leagues Club and that, you see all the poker machines and things. But I'm not, I'm, it didn't make me a big gambler. Um, but it was interesting to see when this younger family member of mine just was so into it at such a young age and they were betting a lot of money as well. And that surprised me because I'd never come across that personally. Um, I, I, but I don't see it as this big demonizing thing. I just think it's it's part of life. It's part of the world. And I think that as long as you do it at the right levels, and as, as I've said already on the podcast, like bet what you can afford to light on fire right now. You know, well, that's if, right. That's if, right. If your wallet caught fire and, and, you know, you bet the amount that you can go, ah, oh, my wallet caught fire, damn, my cards, and there was 20 bucks in there, far out. That sucks. But don't do it if it's your rent money. <laughs> don't do it if it's your, if you've got to pay a bill and that's your bill money. Like, yeah. What you can afford to lose. And that's I think right. if you do that, you're fine. I think, too, betting, advertising in games used to be a lot more um, insistent. There's mm. a, there used to get a lot more of it. Yeah. Um, it's really, it has fallen back a fair bit now. Mm. It's still there, obviously, but it's also a bit easy to ignore. And I think that's the thing is now that it's so commonplace, I think a lot of people see it as just an ad. Mm-hmm. So they just sort of glaze over it now. So Yeah, it was definitely, there was a while there where it was. Uh... It was everywhere. It, it was a real punch in the face. Like the yeah. Waterhouse stuff, I think, was a turning point. And I, I find it hard. It, you know, everyone made it really personal about him because, I don't know, he he looked like fucking Mr. Sheen when he was young or something. And people really didn't like him for whatever reason. And I, I bet even now people are like, oh, fucking Tom Waterhouse. Blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, he cashed out. He's fine. Don't worry about him. He, he won. But... <laughs> Um, that that period of time, it really was like being sledgehammered. Where I think now it's a little more chill, and it's a little more organic, and it's a little more look. If you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, don't worry about it. You know. And I think that that's a good level to be at. Yeah, and they're also, I mean, the the checking in bits of facts and basically a bit of information about the games as well. So it's. Hmm. You're actually learning a little bit about the game at the same time. Um, yeah. So you can actually watch some of that. I know I sometimes watch the um, – uh, there's a pre-game betting thing. I don't know which company it is. Probably shouldn't on, mention it anyway. On, but it's, uh, on, it's on Fox Sports before yeah. the footy starts. And they'll often talk about, you know, how many tries one team will score down one side compared to the other and what the, the other team's defensive record's like over there. Mm-hmm. Stuff that analysts do. Mm-hmm. But they're doing this – as part of their, you know, selling their product for the betting and stuff like that. Mm. But you don't need to listen to the odds. You can still listen to the rest of that and actually get quite informed about rugby league and still take that knowledge into a game and, and see how it's breaking down. And um, you can actually take something from that that's useful, that's mm. got nothing to do with betting, which is helpful. Yeah. Um, so it, it's got a little bit um, better in that regards, which has also made – made the whole betting stuff a little bit more subtle yeah. and less in your face. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd rather see less of it in the actual broadcast of the game being played. I don't mind if it's around, like, outside the broadcast mm-hmm. so that when kids are watching, they're not being hit with it. Mm-hmm. Um, but around the game, before and after, stuff like that, I'm not too fussed by it. I don't mind. Yeah. I just don't want it on the product, that's all. Like, the, being slapped I, in your face like it was. Yeah, and and I I guess the thing, too, that we should talk about is, like, because we're approached, when we started the podcast, we said, let's do a footy podcast, and let's talk about whatever we want, whenever we want, how as long as we want to, probably only go for 100 episodes, but anyway, 
<laughs> and yeah, 100 then, episodes over seven years. Yeah, yeah, it's, that's plenty. We don't want to work ourselves too hard. That's all right, eight weeks later. Okay, well, maybe another 100 episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, and we were like, you know, it would be cool to do a preview show and see if we could get a better company on board because that seems like it would work really well together. And, like, we talked about that before we'd started recording the first episode. We didn't end up having a betting partner on board early on. No. And then towards the end of last year, Palmer Bet approached us and said, hey, we've uh, we've been listening to your podcast and we wanted if you wanted to have us on board uh, as an advertiser. And we were like, yeah, you know, that'd be great. And I've got to say, when we've talked to them, they basically, basically have said, look, if you could, if, because we basically said to them, we've been wanting to do this preview show each week with the betting partner on board and give the odds for that betting partner. And so this works out well for us too. And they were like, that sounds cool. Just use our prices. Um, if you could put our logo on your logo, which we did, we, we knew we were going to be doing that. And do an advert before and after, which is the sort of thing we were doing for our Manscaped as well. Yeah. And uh, so it's been really organic. And they've, they've, they they've were like, that's it, you know, and and – left us to it left us to do everything and we had no directives to say that you know their name however many times or to to use these odds or to you know push this product or anything there's been nothing like that and i think that that's it's been really cool it's been really cool to work with a company like that um who just has been like yeah just you know here it is you use that all you go and do that and we're cool with all of that and um, it's, you know, when you can work with a company like that, it's actually really cool because sometimes you work with the company and Manscaped was great as well with this as well, we got to say. But in the past, I know with my website, I've worked with companies that have um, been annoying to work with and they're like, <laughs> oh, can you change this? Can you change that? What about this? What? Are, and it's like, yeah, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. And you get through it and get through it. So when you work with a company like Manscaped was great, Palmer bet's fantastic at the moment. And, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's been organic. What do you reckon? No, I fully agree. It's, yeah. it's been, um, no, then they're not trying to get us to do anything or change our opinion or anything like that. They just mm-hmm. want us to advertise their stuff. It's pretty much as simple as that and not everything. Just, you know, read out the odds and mention their name a bit. It's pretty basic, um, pretty open and, um, yeah, you know, free flowing sort of relationship, which is exactly what you want. You don't have someone hanging over you and saying you must do it like this and do it like that and be mm. our fucking puppets. There's none of that going on. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, as I said, it's it's really cool when you find a company like yeah. that. It's, you it's know, if, if we sell it, we sell it. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> <laughs> what else could we get? What else other advertising you would like to have, oh. Dr Pepper? Can we can we get some um, Westinghouse on board? <laughs> Tell people why you need Westinghouse. My fridge broke down. <laughs> You're eating out of an esky. Yeah. Oh, and, and and my washing machine. I tell you what, if Elegoo wants to start sending me fucking uh, resin for my printer, I'm spending a lot of money on Elegoo resin, let me tell you. It's got to be water washable too, Elegoo. Yeah. Man, we're selling out hard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Seth Rollins. Yeah. yeah. Cash out, mate. Yeah. Hey, we don't cash out. We yeah. cash in. <laughs> uh, remember, I gambled responsibly. Um, that's right. Yeah, so they're the two emails I think we've had. Let me just double check because I get so many fucking emails during every single day. It is Every single day? It, seriously, every day. Wish I had a dollar for every SEO company that told me my website was really hard to find on Google when they found it. Uh, I, th- I think that's it. I'm pretty sure. Oh, hang on. What's this one? Not his SEO. Yeah, I think that's it. So if you want to email us, ooh, we've just had a team join the tipping competition as well. Really? Yeah, Noah has joined. Noah. So, 126 teams now in the uh, tipping competition. Oh. Um, 
should we talk about the tipping competition, how it's going? Sure, why not? Or should um, we wait till Sunday when the round's over? We should no, wait. We can have a quick mention about it now because I just want to say that I am the absolute average. Absolute average. I'm, I'm smack bang in the middle. As far, as far as middle can go with 125, I'm sitting at 62. Okay, so let me just scroll down. I, I am the bar. Okay, so... You're so, either above me or you're below me. So Noah is gives us 126 now, but he's only got one tip so far. So I think he's only done this round. So Ben is on top. Uh, he, he's got three tips so far this round. Then Jason Reagan, who I mentioned in the last podcast, I was a housemate with Reagan. Um, we lived in a place in Hebersham. It was a share house in Hebersham. Got yeah. to know her there. Uh, stayed very uh, good friends with her for a long time. I actually texted her the other day to have a listen, and she thought I was going to shit talk more about her. And I said, oh, well, I mean, we can now if you want. Yeah. D- do you want to hear all the worst things about Reagan? Oh, yeah. Did she fart all the time? Ah, oh, mate. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> after her is uh, Ben and then Rebecca and then Danny and then Jeremy. And then League Freak is in eighth place at the moment. League Freak is in eighth place. Mate, you're starting yeah. off subtle. Yeah. Look at easing as, easing into it. That's what she said. I <laughs> I like to as long as I can start just solid, because I tend to ramp up towards the end of the year. I tend to really come home strong. That's what she said. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So Yeah. <laughs> There's a team called, I just saw a team called Whole Sharks. Shifovsky's Cat. That's another good name. Uh, what else have we got here? Hassan Sailor. That's another team name. Ooh. That, that's a good one. Uh, you won't beat me. Good one, Mitchell. Try beating me. You're down in 71th place. Even I'm beating you. That's how bad you are. Yeah. Mars Broncos. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's our that's our champ carryover champion. Fucking smashing him at the moment. Um, that premature, Andy Andy Marjolach. Yes, it is. Premature <laughs> congratulations. That's another team name. <laughs> oh shit. Uh, what is another? What's some other cool names? Um, Coxies Tigers, Dragon Balls, Dragons suck balls. <laughs> Finnish Chooks. Whereas tragic Swiss Cowboys, Carsten. Oh, we know who that is. Yeah, down in 91st position. Our famous Frenchman. Yeah, Frenchman. How dare you? Well, I guess he considers all of Europe his. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about RuPaul's Stag Race? That's another one. Chris Woodhead's team. Um, Bozo's Boozers. The Sport Cap. The Ride Offs. Uh, what else have we got here? I've just seen Dick Hat Devil Sauce Squirters, uh, a famous team of our, in our competition last year as well. So, yeah. Meat Pie Cheeks. They're coming second last. No, that's not good. You've got to do better than that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I came across a, a news article before. Yeah. Which entertained me to no end. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the it's on it's on the Fox Sports website, mm-hmm. and the the heading is Sharks Big Guns Return Forcing Reshuffle, Tigers Sweat on Star Duo, mm-hmm. and I thought Tigers have two stars. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Scroll through it again. Oh, you know, as I'm scrolling down, going, I wonder who these two stars are. I, I could figure it out. And it said Tigers stars Luke Brooks and Ken Mormolo. <laughs> Yeah, that's a rough one. Oh, right. Right, those those two. Okay. Um, stars. You, your thoughts? Would you call them stars? No. No, no. I, I think we, we need to put together a kit for the, for the mainstream media. I mean, let's be honest. They're idiots and they need as much help as possible. Yes. We need to let them know which players fall under the the tag superstar. Which ones are under star? Mm-hmm. And then you've just got NRL player. Yes. Um, and possibly even fringe NRL player and then Super League player. Yeah. 
or you know you have Super League start and Super League play somewhere around that. But have have groups and have stages and have the show which players fall under which tier because um this sliding scale of what they think is a star and what isn't um it's it's not working. It's very inconsistent. It really is. Hey, did you see that? Uh that uh, James Hooper was doing the sideline stuff for Fox Sports the other night. I did hear him, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I wasn't watching. Yeah. But I did hear him. Yeah, <laughs> you just heard him. Just, just heard. It was like fucking loud. Do you He's hear some for no reason whatsoever? Yeah. Do you, do you hear some guy that sounds angry for no fucking reason at all? But why is he yelling so much? Does, have strange. they not told him that a microphone is a is a voice magnifier? No <laughs> one needs to. Oh, you know, the, there's something else I've got to bring up for the podcast. So I watch a lot of YouTube because I don't watch normal TV because fuck watching that garbage. Yeah. And so I watch different things and this this advert comes on and it's for a streaming service and they're promoting a fight between Sonny Bill Williams and Barry Hall, right? <laughs> And this fucking advert. Hang on. It's just worth noting. Barry Hall's a bloke who had a draw with Paul Gallon after he made Paul Gallon agree to fight him in a shortened version of a normal boxing bout. Because so the, the halves had to be shortened because he's too fat, old, and lazy to actually have a proper full-length boxing bout. Yeah. He's also the sort of dude that, like, you go out to a letterbox, you open a letter, and he's turned up to the letter opener, and he likes to be on things and with things. Anyway. Um, complaining. Yeah. Complaining. Oh, what, you? People just always look at me a certain way. Fuck off, idiot. No one's thinking yeah, that. Yeah, I'm just trying to open my letterbox. You just fuck off. Yeah, just go away, please. <laughs> like, fucking dickhead. Anyway, so they do this thing, and they're, they're you know, they're, they're fucking talking about the sim- typical boxing bullshit, you know, oh, fucking, oh, oh, oh. and then at the very end of the advert, Sonny Bill Williams goes, it's just like it says, you know, and this fight is on whatever date. I don't even know the date. Who gives a shit? And then it goes, clicks to Sonny Bill Williams, and he's standing there, dressed up like a boxer, and he goes, this is macho. <laughs> I crack up every time it's on. I don't even skip it anymore because it's so funny. <laughs> this is macho. <laughs> Who the fuck thought that that was fucking the thing to say? <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> so apparently him, him for, like how old is Sonny Williams? Sonny Williams has got to be, what, 37? Yeah, I don't 37, know. 38, something like that. Yeah, and how old? Barry Hall's got to be 40-something. Have a look. Benny Hall. Benny Hall. He's 45. Are you fucking serious? He's 45. Okay, so, so well, this is probably the biggest test Sonny Bill Williams has put himself to in a boxing ring. So, because normally, <laughs> Will got, be. yeah, he normally fights guys that fucking stack shelves in Auckland <laughs> and stuff like taxi, that. Taxi drivers and yeah. shelf stackers and greengrocers. Yeah, exactly. Guys, guys that have just got their fucking visa to start being a bouncer at some fucking pub. Somebody you saw take a swing at someone at a at a pub one night. Yeah. So I'll, um I'll go you bro. <laughs> exactly. Uh yeah. Anyway. That I found that very funny. Mm. Do you want to talk about some F one? Yeah, go for it. Okay, so I've been watching a lot of the testing in the F one. It's really interesting because they've brought out the new regs this year. Uh, have, they, have they brought out all the new regulations or just most of them? My understanding is all of them will be oh, in place okay. this year. So they've got the low profile tires. It's interesting because the low profile tires, when they show the the uh, the previews of what the cars would look like, they showed them with really cool looking rims. Oh and, yes. But like the actual cars are going to have like enclosed black, like streamlined rims, oh, which is. I've... Just, I've what? seen one or two in the in the practice today. Have they? Okay, so I've been yeah, yeah I've only been watching. Right. I've only been watching the the testing sessions. So I wondered if they were going to paint them to look good. No, they look. I'm looking at the Red Bull here, and they're just their black black I'm sure enclosed. I, I'm sure I saw one on here that had like rainbow coloured on the. Because I thought what they might have done is get all of the teams to paint them different things. Well, eventually what will happen is the cars will look at it and go, yeah, 
there's four more advertising slots we put on a car now. Imagine if they did it so that as the wheel was turning it, you know, um, had some sort of graphic effect, so it looked like, you know, a sponsor's logo was going around it. Oh, yeah, that'd be that would cool. be pretty cool. That would be cool. Um, anyway, so the the cars this year they use a lot more um, of, of the underneath of the car to basically suck the car down onto the oh, ground. Oh, aerodynamics, yeah, yeah, with the ground effect sort of thing. Um, they were finding early on in testing that they were having a problem with porpoising. And what was happening was that the the cars would suck themselves down to the ground too much that they would cancel out the suction, uh. and then it would start you know, lifting the car back up, but then they'll yep. bring up the low pressure again. So they were bouncing down some of the straights. It was a problem for teams. Um, and it's interesting to see the different side pod designs as well. They've had so many different side pod designs. Some of them are really elaborate. Some of them are tiny. Some of them have uh, like different, like there's one team, I, I wish I could remember what team it was, but basically the side intrusion bar is exposed on their car. And uh-huh. which is completely legal because everything that's around it is not a part of the structure of the car. It's just cosmetic. So they've got these big bars that are out the side of the car for side intrusion. Um, but then they've got different parts of their side pods that are a completely different shape because of it. And it's really interesting to see the different ideas different teams have had. And so they're having their first official uh, practice session ahead of the Bahrain Grand Prix. And uh, do do we know who's leading that? Uh, I think the first session ended just recently. Um, I've only got the one at 15 minutes to go. Let me go to F1, see if it fucking... Here we go. F1, P, F, P1 classification. So Pierre Gasly led that in the Alpha, uh, Alpha Turi. He's a very, uh, I don't know, he's a very underrated driver. Yeah. I, I, he he led the Ferraris of Leclerc and uh, Sainz. And then I'm just seeing George Russell was after them in the Mercedes. Because Mercedes have been talking about their cars are going to need a, a number of races to get up to speed. And I just think that's bullshit. I think that they're foxing everyone. Oh, of course they are. They always do. Um. Whereabouts the Haas's are down the end of the field, as you would expect. <laughs> Valtteri Bottas's Alfa Romeo looks like it didn't do a single lap, which is interesting. I did two laps. Didn't record a time, though. Yeah. There's been a few team changes. I, It's going to be hard to see what... Yeah, you know, It's going to be pretty much an unknown this season, mm. um, which is good. Because yeah. too much of the F1 in the last, God, near decade now has been pretty fucking predictable since they went to the um, the hybrid era. Yeah. It's just been Mercedes absolutely dominating everyone. And well, the, basically right. Red Bull was trying to keep up and then Ferrari got a bit better for about two or three seasons and they fell away again. Well, and last year Ferrari decided to stop developing their car and develop this new car this year. Yeah, these these rules, which is looking like it's been a, a a good idea. Have you seen the Ferrari? My God, it looks beautiful. It does, doesn't it? Uh, and you know what? I was looking at it. And when I first saw it, I was like, that's one of the most beautiful F1 cars I've ever seen. And it's because they've gone back to the traditional Ferrari color. Yes, that's right. And it's just, oh, man. It looks makes, a million bucks. It probably costs a lot more than fucking that. Fucking balls wet looking at that car. <laughs> <laughs> I think the team that will surprise everyone this year, and it might not surprise everyone, but I think it'll be really in the race for a lot of races, is the Alpine team. Yeah, they start to pick up a fair bit at the end of end of last season. Mm. Um, who are their drivers? That might be a problem. Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon. Oh, yeah, no, they they will be good. Yeah, they'll be all right, eh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Nico Hulkenberg is in. He's at the at Aston Martin. Um, Daniel Aston, Ricciardo. Aston, Aston Martin's not going to be too bad because half the drives are really good. Yep, yep. The um, other half. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ricardo and Lando Norris write down the um, timing screens after first practice. 
Yeah, they, but, I must admit, from what I saw, they weren't really trying to push out um, good times. I think they're still kind of working a bit on aero. Mm-hmm. So they're not really pushing the car at the moment. And there's a few teams doing that. They're just sort of getting idea of where the aero is to try and get a better um, aerodynamic setup for the race. Mm-hmm. I think we'll probably see them pushing the car a bit more in the, the next practice session. Mm-hmm. Um, we'll probably get a better idea then. Because there's still some teams out there. You know, the, sometimes they get that big white grid thing they put on the back of the car with all these little sensors on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there were still cars racing around in, in – uh, in the first practice session there with that on the back of it. Oh, really? Yeah, so... Wow. It's hard to gauge anything at this stage because they're, they're still doing basically testing. Yeah, that's basic, basic testing, mm. that sort of stuff. And we might see some more changes once um, the next practice session gets underway because usually they practice um, long runs mm-hmm. and the third session they practice, you know, a bit of qualifying practice and stuff like that. So we'll see how they go with that. Do you like the look of the new cars overall? I do. Yeah. I do. Um, I do like the fact, too, that they, they're they not all the same. Yeah, same. They've been a problem. Basically, every car is almost identical. Mm. Um, but now there's lots of different changes. So just you might end up with just one random car might just be absolutely pissing it all over another, t- you know, early other cars mm. at two tracks every year. You know, holy hell, they're a chance. And then all of a sudden you don't see them for the rest of the year. Yeah. But that's sort of. That being thrown up every now and then is enough to keep the, the uh, championship a bit up in the air, mm. and that's a good thing. I know that because uh, there was – obviously, when you bring in the new regulations and they were very specific. I think this is the first time I've seen new regulations brought in by car designers who actually understand what other car designers are going to do with this. And they actually had a grasp on what does make really good racing. And so, you know, they wanted the cars to be able to follow close to one another. But they did leave enough in the regulations that teams could play around with some stuff because there was worries that they would, all the cars would look the same. And I've never seen a grid that looks more different than this year. Maybe the early 90s. It was a, kind of a similar era where you saw very different looking cars, but they, they all look very different this year. The weird one for me is Mercedes. Their car reminds me of a real old school turbo era because it basically doesn't have side pods. It's it's really, really weird how they've shaped their car. They've gone in a real specific direction and it, it's got a better work for them because if it doesn't, they're so different to everyone else. They might be on the wrong track, but that's why we have the races. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's it's, it's going to be a fascinating year this year. Um, and, hey, we don't have the Sochi race this year because, you know, somehow that's going to make Russia stop bombing the Ukraine. Mm. Uh, I know. Um, it's funny how all these sports in there just saying, "Oh, we're not going to have anything to do with Russia anymore." It's uh, it's it's an it's a nice gesture and all, yeah. but you know, at the end of the day, Russia doesn't really care. Yeah, exactly. Because if, if they did, they wouldn't be going to war. Yeah, it's that simple. Yeah, it's like um, if it's the difference between like, let let's go to war with one of our close neighbours, but uh, we'll lose a Grand Prix. Should we? Fuck, is it really we can't worth do it? it? Yeah. yeah, we're stuck. Do we really want to make those sacrifices? <laughs> Daniel so Medvedev won't be able to play tennis this year because of us. Is that what we really want? <laughs> it's really weird how it's that, uh, you know, virtue signaling shit. Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's it's crazy. Mm. Makes you pine for the old days of just getting COVID. Does remember COVID? Do you remember COVID? Oh, glorious times, glorious times. Yes, Some were. of the best years of my life. They really were. They they were the best two weeks of uh, <laughs> of the decade. Oh yeah, I, I didn't actually get it. It's the only fucking virus I've been able to catch. Yeah, yeah, same here. I actually did a COVID test today. It was one of the the lollipop ones. You know, the ones you put in your mouth for ninety seconds. And no, I've not heard about those ones. 
Yeah. Well, well, you know, that's what the guy at the train station told me it was anyway. Ah, uh, right. Was this before uh, or after he put his fly down? <laughs> I don't know. I just heard the zip and sound. He said, put this in your mouth. Um, I, yeah, I, I did the test. <laughs> I haven't got COVID because I've been coughing a bit. But yeah. I think it's because I've been turning air conditioners on and off. And I've also been breathing in the fumes of fucking, you know, this uh, resin I'm using. And I stopped stopped wearing a mask. You know, I know that's I should a, wear a mask. That's what you do. It's only it's only fumes, mate. They're listen, not going to hurt you. Listen, I'm a man, okay? Yeah. And if I can't breathe in some carcinogens every, you know, 20 or 30 minutes while I'm doing my 3D prints, when can I do it? Exactly right. Exactly so, right. Yeah, and that's fine. I, I've hardly been coughing through this episode. That's good. That's good. Which means that your airways are now cleared enough to go and inhale some more. Exactly. They've they've hardened up. Yep. And uh, you know they've got those those scabs on them. That's what you want from your airways. Exactly right. Yeah, that's uh, that's healing in process. Exactly. It's just getting you tougher. Hey. <laughs> You'll be fine. You'll be fine. <laughs> All I ask, I don't know if I've said this on the podcast when when uh, I talk to my uh, the people that I'm closest to about when I die, my wishes when I die. The only thing I ask is that my ashes are consumed. <laughs> Have you specified by whom? Anybody that wants any of my shit has to consume my ashes, and that's my one request. And like, I get a lot of I get a lot of la- laughs and stuff like that. And like, I'm not doing that. And it's like, listen. I'm going to die one day and you are going to think to yourself, there's only one thing he ever said over and over again, consume my ashes. And if you don't do that, well, then that was my one wish. And you just decide to throw it away. Well, also, as you said, if anyone with any of your stuff, they need to consume your ashes. People don't realize that you've been collecting the one thing that everybody wants yeah. around the world. So everybody has got a vested interest in consuming your ashes. They bet, yeah. If listen, I know what everyone that listens to this podcast wants, all right? I've been collecting it. I got gallons of the stuff. Okay, I know you want it. Little taste. It's fine. It's normal. It's understandable. You're only human. You got to consume my ashes first. That's exactly right. <laughs> well, that's a con- that should be in a contract. It is. Oh, good, 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 good. Part of the contract. You want anything that belongs to me when I die, consume my ashes. Otherwise, can we, can we add to that contract mm-hmm. that they have to do it on a YouTube video for the podcast? Like that'll be the last episode. Yeah, the last episode. <laughs> the last, the last episode I appear on is just my ashes <laughs> being being consumed by someone who wants like you know one of your pairs of underpants or something. I feel like it'll be a very similar outcome to the cinnamon challenge. <laughs> where just people start coughing and breathing out fucking big puffs of cinnamon. You go, that, yep, that, that doesn't count. You've got to take the whole lot. That would be Suck great. Suck that cinnamon back in. Go out into the universe and the last thing you do is make someone gag. <laughs> well, on that bombshell, <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's put this let's put this turkey to bed. Hard edits are our friend. <laughs> they are. They are. See if you can spot the hard edit. Yeah. Get back to us with the timestamp, and you uh, can you can win a nothing prize. Where can people find us, Andrew? They can find us on Instagram and Twitter at at uh, Fergo Freak Pod. Mm. We're on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, uh, MySpace. So check us out on all of those. Uh, make sure you go to your podcast listening device and give us a five star rating and leave a review, please. We haven't had any of those for fucking years now. Yeah, give us a review, people. You slack. Yeah. You fucking slack. I mean, you leave us a review. Not only do we talk about it on the actual podcast episode, make you famous there. We put it up on our website for forever. Make you famous forever. That's what we do for you. All we want is you to give us some words. You know, it's a good deal. Mm. I don't know why people aren't taking it up. Exactly. It's like consuming my ashes. It's just win-win. Exactly right. <laughs> There's no loser here. Exactly. So anyway. that. It's been a good episode. Thank it you. For, thank you for turning up for once. Oh, you know me, mate. I just, I turn up when I feel like it. If I can blow in. <laughs> so if this keeps going on, you'll have to just start having me as a guest episode. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'll appear in all the guest episodes from now on on the website. 
I'd have to find another Fergo to host the podcast. Do you know how difficult hey, that's going to be? Blake Ferguson's free. You know what? I was going to rule it out, and then I thought, man, parties afterwards. Yeah. Is he still in jail? I don't know where he is. I feel like he might still be in jail in, he, in uh, Japan. He might be. Mm. Anyway. What a, what a peanut. Anyway, thanks for tuning in, everyone, and uh, we'll catch you all next time. Palmer bet with the big don't argue. Punters will love that. Download our app today and enjoy tackle busting benefits with great odds, more markets, and same game multi every NRL match at Palmer Bet. Gamble responsibly. For gambler's help, call 1 800 858 858.